Hello, Glenn Patterson again. One of the most challenging water issues of the 21st century is scarcity. In fact, according to the United Nations Development Program, water scarcity is among the main problems of any type to be faced by many societies and the world in the 21st century. More people and more aquatic ecosystems in more places on the globe have to cope with scarcity of fresh water of suitable quality. What is water scarcity? It's both a natural and a human-made phenomenon. There's enough fresh water on the planet for seven billion people, but it's distributed unevenly and too much of it is wasted, polluted, and unsustainably managed. Accordingly, there are two types of water scarcity, physical or absolute water scarcity, and economic water scarcity. Physical water scarcity is a result of inadequate natural water resources to supply a region's demand. And economic water scarcity is a result of poor management of available water resources that might be sufficient if managed properly. According to the United Nations Development Program, the latter, economic water scarcity, is found more often to be the cause of countries or regions experiencing water scarcity as most countries or regions have enough water to meet household, industrial, agricultural, and environmental needs, but lack the means to provide it in an accessible manner. Of course, water scarcity affects people, but it also affects the aquatic ecosystems that depend on fresh water for their survival. According to National Geographic, more than 20% of the 10,000 known freshwater fish species have become extinct or imperiled in recent decades. There are a number of causes for water scarcity. One is increasing population. More people means greater demand for the fresh water we all need to survive, grow our crops, and manufacture our goods. And as our standard of living rises, so does our demand for water. According to the UNDP again, Water use has been growing at more than twice the rate of population increase in the last century. And although there is no global water scarcity as such, an increasing number of regions are chronically short of water. Global climate change will bring more precipitation to some areas and less to others, but the increasing temperature we're expecting over the next several decades will cause greater water loss through evapotranspiration so that the net effect over most of the globe will be decreased water availability. On top of that, we're likely to see intensification of extreme weather, meaning longer, deeper droughts. Another human activity that makes water scarcer is overpumping of groundwater, often called groundwater mining, in which water is removed from aquifers more quickly than it is replenished through natural recharge processes. In the U.S. alone, between 1900 and 2008, we have lost enough underground water to fill Lake Erie twice, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. That volume jumped by 25% just after the year 2000. Finally, even when water is available, it's often polluted by runoff or discharges from homes, industries, farms, mines, city streets, and areas where the vegetation has been disturbed and soil has been eroded. Where do we find areas of significant water scarcity? It's not too surprising that they tend to be found where precipitation is low and population is high, and where there are economic and social barriers to effective water management. Water scarcity already affects every continent except Antarctica. According to the UNDP, around 1.2 billion people, or almost one-fifth of the world's population, live in areas of physical water scarcity, and 500 million people are approaching this situation. Another 1.6 billion people, or almost one quarter of the world's population, face economic water shortage, where countries lack the necessary infrastructure to take water from rivers and aquifers. This map from the International Water Management Institute shows areas where we tend to find physical water scarcity, economic water scarcity, and approaching physical water scarcity. So what's being done about this problem of water scarcity? As is so often the case, the answer is it depends. 
In some instances, very little has been accomplished to overcome the natural and human obstacles to providing adequate water supplies. Probably the most notorious example is the Aral Sea in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan, whose watershed is divided among six countries. Once the fourth largest lake in the world, the Aral Sea has since 1960 lost 90% of its area and 92% of its volume. The primary cause is excessive diversion, approaching 100% of its surface water inflow in order to supply irrigation water primarily for cash crops such as cotton. The shrunken lake has also become excessively salty, killing off a once lucrative fishery and even the salt tolerant fish that were subsequently imported. The nations sharing its watershed have established entities aimed at joint research and problem solving, but little has been accomplished to date. An example from the United States is the Brazos River in Texas. The recent multi-year drought exacerbated problems of a dry climate, a large population, and heavy use for irrigation and industry. Various interest groups have been combining and suing each other in court to press for their interpretation of Texas's complex water allocation laws and arguing about the wisdom of building more dams on the river. Meanwhile, at times and in certain places, the river runs dry. On a more positive note, we can examine several types of actions that are being taken to deal constructively with water scarcity. These actions fall into the general categories of monitoring, so that we can know the extent of the problem, supply enhancement, conservation to make better use of existing water resources, recycling, pollution control, and policy changes. Adequate monitoring is needed to help define the scope of the problem and to detect trends, both good and bad. Unfortunately, our efforts to monitor the quantity and quality of global water resources are spread very thinly, especially in developing countries. And in some developed countries, such as the U.S., Long-term monitoring programs are losing stations every year due to budget cuts and policy decisions. Supply enhancement is a response to scarcity that has its roots early in human history. Thousands of years ago, ancient Somalians constructed hand-dug wells at intervals along their nomadic routes to ensure a water supply while they traveled. About 3,000 years ago, Middle Eastern civilizations constructed underground water delivery systems known as kanats to bring water from a mother well in a hillside to a village or farm on the plains. Perhaps more familiar to us are the grand engineering projects of the Romans and the Chinese to carry water long distances to places where it was needed. Over the next few slides, we'll take a look at some present-day supply enhancement methods that are in use in various parts of the world. Not all of these methods are suitable for all water scarce areas, but most are being increasingly implemented in areas where they are suitable. Desalination takes advantage of the fact that 97% of the Earth's water is salty. To make this abundant resource potable, large amounts of energy must be used to boil salty water or to force it through membranes with micropores small enough to filter out dissolved salt. Until recent decades, in most places, this energy cost made desalination too costly an alternative. There has also been an environmental cost related to disposal of the concentrated brine solution that results from the process, but in most cases it can be discharged far out to sea through a discharge pipeline. As filtration technology has improved and demand for water has increased, desalination has come to be an accepted alternative in more locations, both for seawater and for brackish groundwater. Currently, there are 16,000 desalination plants in operation, many of which are in the Middle East or along the California coast. Rain harvesting takes several forms all of which aim to capture rain and snow locally before it evaporates, runs off, or infiltrates. One of the simplest forms of rain harvesting is a rain barrel attached to a roof downspout. 
The rain barrel concept can take many forms, as you can see in these pictures. Some water short communities, such as Gibraltar, have made use of large concrete or natural rock rain catchments. This one has now been supplanted by two desalination plants. Rain harvesting can be helpful in storing modest amounts of water from wet periods so that it can be used during dry periods. Its big advantage is that it captures water at or near the point of use so that it does not need to be transported long distances. Of course, it does not actually increase the amount of precipitation that falls, it just captures some of it before it runs off or infiltrates. Fog harvesting can be considered an interesting variation on rain harvesting. In dry areas that are subject to frequent fog, moisture can be extracted from the fog by letting the droplets collect on a net or similar structure. This process has produced up to 12,000 liters per day in Eritrea in northeastern Africa in a process that mimics the way in which redwood trees get much of their water. The captured water would probably otherwise remain in the atmosphere. Of course, this process works only when fog is present and has somewhat limited geographic suitability. This map shows locations where fog harvesting studies have been conducted. The idea of modifying weather to create more clouds and rain has been around for as long as there have been rain dances. In recent decades, the technology of seeding promising skies with silver iodide crystals has made significant progress. Since it's difficult to prove its effectiveness, the concept is often met with skepticism. Yet sophisticated monitoring and modeling studies show that it can produce small but measurable increases in precipitation. Of course, critics can still say the process captures moisture that might have fallen as precipitation someplace else farther downwind. Nonetheless, weather modification to enhance precipitation is routinely practiced in 11 U.S. states and 33 countries, shown in blue and green on these maps. The countries shown in red use weather modification in efforts to suppress hailstorms. Another supply enhancement method that has been around since early in history is water importation. These large engineering projects can be effective in moving water from wet areas to dry ones where people need water. Some projects utilize gravity flow, while others involve massive pumps, leading to the saying that water moves uphill toward money. Water importation can indeed be costly, especially when it involves pumping. In dry climates, water losses through evaporation from canal surfaces can be significant. And water importation, like weather modification, can leave some people feeling that they and the rivers and lakes important to them have come out on the losing end of the project. Not all water importation is done via canals and tunnels. Towing fresh water through the sea in huge plastic bags has become an accepted practice for some dry islands such as Cyprus where the economics work out right. Some visionaries keep talking about towing icebergs, but so far this has not been done as a practical method. So we've looked at several methods used to enhance water supplies. Now it's time to shift gears and look at some of the many ways in which people are trying to make better use of the water we have. We'll start with a look at water conservation in urban areas. One of the best ways to conserve water is to avoid wasting it, and one of the best ways to do that is to repair and maintain our deteriorating water infrastructure. Many of the distribution systems for our cities were installed 80, 90, 100, or even more years ago, and are now far past their expected lifespan. According to the American Water Works Association and the Environmental Protection Agency, there's an average of 700 water main breaks every day in the United States. On top of that is the continuous loss from millions of small ongoing leaks. An average of about 17% of treated drinking water in the U.S. is lost to leaks in the distribution systems. In some cities, the loss is estimated at 50%. 
This amounts to a loss of about 2.1 trillion gallons per year, or about 550 million cubic meters. That's enough water to cover Manhattan 300 feet deep, or 92 meters deep, with water. The cost estimate for repairing the leaky pipes is about $1 trillion over 25 years. Another proven way to conserve water is to reduce household water use. We've all seen the many helpful tips for saving water in the home, such as installing water-saving fixtures, washing only full loads, turning off the tap while lathering up, brushing teeth or washing dishes, catching shower water in a bucket till it warms up, and so forth. One of the best ways to encourage domestic water conservation is through public education campaigns, and some of these have been quite successful. When the summer of 2013 turned out to be even drier than predicted, Denver Water stepped up its campaign to use even less. Since 70% of domestic water use in the United States is for irrigation of lawns and gardens, this is a great opportunity for water conservation. It helps to water earlier late in the day when evaporative loss is less and to avoid overwatering, but it helps even more to convert water guzzling lawns and gardens to xeriscape or plants that are adapted to drier climates. Xeriscape doesn't have to mean just yuccas and cactus. The photo on the right is an example of a xeriscape garden in Colorado. Some cities facing water scarcity are subsidizing the conversion from lawns to xeriscape. The Southern Nevada Water Authority in Las Vegas pays its customers a dollar to a dollar fifty for every square foot of grass that they replace with desert landscaping. Residents can receive up to three hundred thousand dollars per year for converting their property back to desert. Golf courses are also big water users, accounting for one half percent of all U.S. water withdrawals, according to the U.S. Golf Association and the USGS. A typical 80-acre, 18-hole golf course in the humid northeast uses about the same amount of water as 65 homes, while a course in the dry southwest uses about the same as 325 homes. Some golf course managers in dry climates are realizing significant savings in both water and maintenance by installing synthetic artificial turf on greens and other parts of golf courses. Rural areas also offer significant opportunities for water conservation. The single largest use of water worldwide is for irrigation of crops. Actions such as irrigating early or late in the day, using minimal cultivation, and using mulch, manure, and compost to improve water holding capacity of the soil can help to reduce water consumption. So can improvements such as lining ditches to reduce seepage, converting from spray to drip irrigation, using soil moisture sensors to control irrigation, and switching to more water-efficient crops. Watershed management practices can also help conserve water. Streamside plants with their roots in the saturated zone, known as phreatophytes, which are often invasive species such as Russian olive and tamarisk, can literally suck water out of a stream. Land and water management agencies, such as the National Park Service here in Glen Canyon National Monument, put significant efforts into removing such vegetation. The lower example shows Malasi Bayou and the Wichita River in Louisiana, where the Fish and Wildlife Service removed artificial levees to allow the river to reconnect with its floodplain and so have more opportunity to recharge alluvial aquifers. Sand dams could be considered a type of rainwater harvesting technique that creates miniature alluvial aquifers for storage of storm runoff. A small dam is built across a river that tends to carry heavy loads of sand. Both sand and water are captured behind the dam. The captured sand typically contains 25 to 40 percent water by volume, which can be tapped using a simple well. According to the Africa Sand Dam Foundation, a dam like this one in Kenya can provide a year-round supply of water for up to a thousand people. Reducing evaporative loss from standing water is a conservation practice that is sometimes used where it will not interfere with other uses of the pond or lake. 
The water surface can be covered with a thin emulsion of a non-toxic chemical or with polypropylene discs or polyethylene plastic sheets or old tires filled with polystyrene. Several of these examples are from Australia. One plan for a pond cover near Jamestown, Australia includes a design for a multi-purpose cover that generates solar electricity while at the same time reducing evaporation. One of the features of integrated water resources management that can help to reduce water loss and ensure steady supplies is conjunctive use of groundwater and surface water. Conjunctive use can be as simple as having a small utility rely on both a well and a stream intake for its water supply, or it can be more complex involving recycling loops to recharge the aquifer when there's water or treated wastewater to use for this purpose. And speaking of water recycling, this is an area of significant growth in water conservation, both in the home and in communities. In the home, recycling is usually a matter of collecting gray water from showers, sinks, tubs, and washing machines, and using it for flushing toilets and sometimes for watering plants. On the community scale, Anyone who lives downstream from another town is probably already drinking some recycled water. In a more direct way, treated wastewater can be sent to recharge basins where it helps to recharge aquifers, or used directly in a factory or farm, or used to flush toilets and water plants. Los Angeles and San Diego tried local recycling of treated wastewater, often called toilet to tap, in the 1990s, but ran into too much opposition based mostly on the yuck factor. However, opinions change, and now Orange County, California, uses 7 million gallons per day of recycled water, and San Diego plans to derive one-third of its supply from recycled water by the year 2035. This reminds us that an important way to make the most of the water we have is to keep it clean. Controlling both point sources of pollution, such as sewage, and non-point sources, such as agricultural runoff, helps to ensure the availability of clean water for other uses downstream. More information about pollution control is contained in the lecture on water quality. When people are faced with no options other than polluted water for their supply, fortunately there are some new low-cost technologies available that can remove pollutants at the point of use. A great example is the life straw, which removes bacteria, protozoa, and viruses while you drink. A forerunner of this device, called Life Straw Guinea Worm, distributed in Africa by the Carter Center, has been credited with reducing the occurrence of guinea worm disease from 3.5 million cases in 1986 to just 148 cases in 2013. There are also ways we can conserve water without ever encountering it as actual water. Water can be saved indirectly by reducing our water footprint, meaning taking actions that reduce the amount of water needed to produce the goods and services we use. For example, when we reduce our use of electricity, we reduce the use of cooling water for thermoelectric power plants. We can also choose foods that require less water in their production. Even taking this course with your computer has an indirect water footprint because of the cooling water required for computer operations. In all of this discussion about coping with water scarcity by enhancing supply and conserving what we have, there is one important point that overshadows all of the actions that have been described. This is the role of effective policy and governance in controlling the fate of our water resources. Recalling the scarcity maps we saw at the beginning of the lecture, it's important to remember that while 1.2 billion people face physical water scarcity, an even larger number, 1.6 billion, or almost a quarter of the world's population, faces economic water scarcity. For these people, water is generally physically available in sufficient quantity to meet their needs, but economic, social, and political forces keep it out of their reach. Even in countries with effective governance structures, some existing policies work against efficient use of water. Examples might include the use it or lose it aspect of certain water allocation schemes, 
or the lack of a mechanism to make a temporary or permanent transfer of water from one user to another, or pricing schemes that discourage conservation by charging less for each unit of water when more is used. Water pricing schemes can also contribute to scarcity for low-income people by failing to provide a minimal allocation of water to meet basic human needs at an affordable price. Government policies on water resources management may fail to provide for basic infrastructure to obtain, treat, and transport water to the people who need it, may fail to leave sufficient water in the rivers and lakes to support aquatic life, and may fail to adequately prepare for droughts. So moving toward effective governance and policy based on democratic principles and a realistic understanding of water supplies and needs can go a long way toward correcting these problems and making water available to those people and ecosystems that need it. Many of the concepts touched on in this lecture are eloquently described in greater detail in a recently published book by Brian Richter of the Nature Conservancy's Freshwater Initiative. In Chasing Water, a guide for moving from scarcity to sustainability, Richter details seven principles for sustainable water management. Not surprisingly, most of these principles relate to effective governance and policy. Without going into too much detail, we can take a brief look at our four recurring geographic focus areas to see how well their water resources are being managed to avoid scarcity. In the Colorado River Basin, the 1922 Colorado River Compact and its associated Law of the River set a fairly clear vision of overall management, but they do have some serious flaws. The compact promises more water than the over-allocated river can deliver in many years. The compact also sets up a conflict between the upper basin states and the lower basin states. And two important voices were absent from the table. Mexico, which was treated as an afterthought, and the needs of the river itself, which were basically ignored. As a result, in most years, the river dries up before reaching the sea, leaving its ecologically important delta region devoid of water and life. A few voices, such as the Colorado River Delta Water Trust, are working to change this, but it's an uphill battle. In the case of the Ogallala Aquifer, there is no centralized compact or governing body responsible for the whole aquifer. Water management policy is divided among the eight states overlying the aquifer with different laws governing groundwater use and different levels of interest in sustainable management of the aquifer. There are some efforts to provide overall policy direction, but again, it is an uphill battle, and in many parts of the aquifer, such as those shown in the reddish colors, the water levels continue to decline. The Mekong River touches six countries in Southeast Asia, again dividing the political landscape of the basin. While there is an International River Basin Commission, its authority is limited, and some countries are able to act unilaterally to the detriment of others. The Murray-Darling Basin in Australia has probably experienced the most crippling drought of the four areas in recent years, but it also has the strongest governance structure. In 2007, Australia passed the Water Act and created the Murray-Darling Basin Authority with the powers to develop and enforce policies to manage the rivers in the face of drought and overallocation. Under the Murray-Darling Basin Plan developed by the authority in conjunction with basin stakeholders, the goal is to manage the sustainable use of the basin's water resources in a manner that protects the environment as well as the communities and industries that depend on it. Many of the entrenched stakeholder communities in the basin felt their interests were being infringed by the plan, but it has also been called a balanced approach. The policy shifts and subsequent enforcement did go a long way toward keeping water in the rivers and meeting the basic needs of the water users and the environment throughout the basin. On the whole, Richter gives the Murray-Darling Basin Plan high marks for effective water governance and coping with water scarcity. To summarize, one-fifth of the world's population, about 1.2 billion people, face physical water scarcity, while another one-quarter, about 1 1.6 billion, face economic water scarcity. In addition to people, many aquatic ecosystems are also under severe stress due to insufficient water. Several factors, both natural and human-related, are making the problem worse. There are many ways to enhance our supplies and make better use of what water we have, 
but the greatest need is for effective policy and governance pertaining to our water resources. Hope you've enjoyed this lecture and the course. Thank you very much.